Jay did his undergrad across the street at UCSD. He then went on to do an MD and a PhD at Yale uh, and followed that up with clinical training at Brigham Young as well as postdoctoral training at Harvard. Uh, he's currently an associate professor of medicine at UT Southwestern. Great. Thank you, Luke. I'd like to really thank Luke and Mark Mercola for this great opportunity to come back to UCSD. It's really very exciting for me. It was many, many years ago that I graduated from uh, Muir College. Now I'm in Texas. As you can see, we have somewhat of a Wild West attitude towards stem cells in Texas, but it's very fun to, to come to California. Um, I'd like to start with sort of a metaphor for um, stem cell chemical biology, and this is something I did with my son yesterday. We went, we went fishing in the uh, San Diego Bay, and we caught like 50 fish. It was unbelievable. He caught 40 fish, I caught 10. And it's sort of very similar to chemical biology in that you catch lots of fish, you have to decide which ones are keepers and which ones to throw back. Yesterday we threw all of them back, and uh, what I'd like to tell you is a little story about a a uh, fishing expedition for small molecules that can help mediate uh, heart repair in, uh, in, the, in, in animal models, ultimately hoping to generate new pharmaceutical agents that could help repair of the heart in humans. Let me just start with a little bit of background. I'm going to go fast because I only have a, a little bit of time. Um, heart attack, cardiovascular disease, heart failure is the number one killer of human beings. And it's an escalating problem that just continues to grow, not just in our society, but globally at this point. The American Heart Association estimates that within the next decade, it will cost $1 trillion per year in the United States for health care of individuals with, uh, with heart disease, most uh, predominantly heart failure, and also in lost wages. So it's a, it's a huge, huge problem. And we're really not very good about repairing this problem. On the, Left, you'll see a heart. This is a mouse heart, but it could equally be a human heart. The heart has been injured by a heart attack. And you can see which button is the, I don't want to shut off the slides. I know everyone. Oh, laser, OK. Oh, the laser, OK. OK, right, terrific, thank you. Sorry about that. This heart has been injured by a myocardial infarction. You can see one of the major walls has been knocked out and has been replaced by fibrosis, with it, which is non-contractile tissue, doesn't contribute to the function of the heart. You can imagine this is like a car driving with one flat tire, and you go through the rest of your life with one flat tire on your, on your vehicle. This is what we imagine regenerative repair would look like if you could replace minimize the amount of scar and actually replace it with muscle tissue. And it's important to know, do you think of muscle in this context of just like a, a, uh, a ribeye steak or something, but the heart muscle is actually very, very sophisticated structurally. There, there are six capillaries for every myocyte. It's, it's innervated. It's got fibroblasts that support the cell. So it's actually a very, very complex tissue. And if we think about re regenerating that sort of muscle, it's not as simple as, as it might initially appear. The strategy that we've taken and why I was asked to speak at this session by uh, Luke and Mark is that we've taken a small molecule approach to try to target native progenitor cells in the heart in order to induce them to, instead of making that fibrotic repair, instead of making a scar, try to redirect them in their differentiation program towards muscle rebuilding uh, repair. Very, very challenging problem. I'll tell you at the very beginning, we're not really that close to where we'd like to be. But it, at least conceptually, it's a great concept that we can sort of take a small molecule, target a resident progenitor cell, induce those cells to become muscle rather than scar. Now, the one problem with the heart is that we don't really know who the progenitor cells are. In fact, there probably are no real stem cells in the heart. There are progenitor type cells that can regenerate various lineages of the heart, but there's certainly no real stem cell in the, in the sense of say, a, a, a dentate gyrus uh, progenitor cell in the brain or other places in the body. The heart actually knows not to regenerate, and that's a different story. I don't have time to get into that, but it, it knows this. Just to put things in context, too, I have to say that this is the mouse heart and this is the human heart. We're a long, long way from being able to get anything done in the human heart. And actually, over the past decade, there have been many, many strategies of injecting stem cells, various other things into the heart that can completely regenerate the mouse heart. Not a single one of those has even approached clinical utility. The, the effectiveness of the stem cell trials 
that have been done in humans over the past decade have been really very, unfortunately, disappointing, and we are really not very close to repairing the heart through regeneration. What we study is actually something called the epicardium, which is the outermost layer of the heart that has a unique developmental origin and has a, a type of cell in it that has at least the potential to regenerate um, structures in the heart, including muscle cells. We study a particular type of mouse called the not transgenic notch reporter mouse, where if you cause a heart attack in the mouse experimentally, you get activation of, of notch in these cells. They replicate and sort of form a thickened layer around the heart. This is the layer of the heart that has the potential to, uh, it, it repairs the heart through fibrosis. It has the potential, at least conceptually, to um, mediate regeneration. So the idea is we want to develop drugs that we can put into the mouse and have those drugs target that particular cell type. Because one of the problems in our field is that in some ways it's easy to see repair of the heart, but it's harder to actually see at molecular levels that you're, you're inducing changes actually in cells that are becoming different, different things. So it's important to take sort of a very ground level perspective and actually look for gene expression changes in those individual cells that you believe can go on to, to repair the heart. Using this mouse, we can isolate this cell type. It's called notch-activated epicardium-derived cells. They're multipotent stromal cells that do participate in heart repair. So the idea is, can we take this particular cell in this transgenic mouse strain, find molecules that we can give to the mouse systemically that will modulate the differentiation process of these cells. Again, normally these cells go on to make the fibrotic scar. Can we redirect these cells to actually become muscle cells? So we've done that. We, we did a screen of our library at UT Southwestern. Um, we made a knock-in uh, back that we, we, we put into P19 CL6 cells, which is a cell line that's predisposed actually a little bit towards cardiogenic differentiation. We screened our library, we identified molecules that could induce muscle gene expression, could induce myogenic differentiation, but again, it's important to note that not all the cells become muscle cells, just a subset. We can even get them to form beating embryoid bodies. And we ended up with a collection of very, these are, this, these are my fish from the big fishing expedition. We have the, our top 10 list of, of molecules that are all very, very interesting. They all induce muscle gene expression. They, some of them can make the embryoid bodies beat or make them differentiate into embryoid bodies. Um, but we're still very far from, from knowing exactly how these molecules work, who their targets are, what the pathways are, the mechanisms. The one we focus most on that I'm going to present to you today is something called isoxazole, or just ISX. And one thing I'm not going to tell you about is that we are studying, because today's talk is really focused on endogenous stem cell repair, these molecules, many of them, do actually very interesting things to human uh, iPS cells differentiating into cardiomyocytes. We're actually very, very good, a fantastic protocol developed at University of Wisconsin to actually push um, iPS cells to cardiomyocytes, almost with 99% efficiency. Our molecules are, have very interesting effects on, that, on those protocols as well, but I don't have time to really tell you about that today. Just to sort of tell you quickly, Chemical biology is half chemistry. We have very strong support from a, our chemistry group that's actually at UT San Antonio down the road from us in Dallas. So we have this one molecule called isoxazole, or ISX, which is just short for, for the structure. It's actually a very simple drug-like looking molecule that came out of that original screen. We can inject that molecule, and it's actually a third generation of this molecule. This wasn't the original molecule molecule that came out of the screen. That's where the chemistry support is so important. We can inject this molecule into a mouse and then harvest tissues from the mouse and look for activation of gene expression. Now, this is a mouse that has that same back knock-in transgene that we used to make the original stem cell line. So we made transgenic mice containing that same transgene. And in fact, we see upregulation of gene expression specifically in the heart, a little bit in the stomach, and it's known that this gene NKX2.5 is expressed in the, in the mouse for stomach. We were very happy about this. This is a molecule that came out of the screen. We can inject it into a mouse and see gene expression in the target organ, in the target cells, we believe that we were really looking for. And this is just a mouse before injection, after injection, once daily, very simple in, in, injection regimen and then washing out a few, a few weeks later. So clearly reversible, 
but it actually, it really works. It induces gene expression in these cells in the heart. The molecule does many things. We don't understand exactly how it's working. I'll show you a little bit about our target studies in a minute, but it induces DNA synthesis in the heart. It activates notch in, in myocytes. These potentially are newborn or newly born cardiomyocytes in the heart. It induces dramatic gene expression changes in those particular cells that we isolate from the heart. The notch activated epicardium derived cells, very dramatic activation of muscle gene. It improves function sli slightly. It does everything that by conventional criteria in, in our field, you could potentially call it regeneration. We're, we're very cautious about that because again, we have to work by the rules of pharmacology and there's no real pixie dust here. We need to look at specific gene expression in cells and really see how it works and what the actual mechanism is. We can see gene expression, appropriate gene expression changes. Again, these cells that look like newly born cells. So it looks like it's really working when we do, I won't go into the detail here, but we do a number of injury models where we injure the mouse either by ligating a vessel, causing a myocardial infarction. We can improve survival of those animals. So curiously, they actually survive with bigger infarcts rather than smaller infarcts. And if we hypothesize that we were inducing regeneration, we we're really not doing that. They actually just survive better because of this drug, even though their infarcts are smaller, or excuse me, larger. Animals that had large infarcts in the con controlled group all died. So we are, we are enhancing survival because we're allowing animals with larger infarcts to survive. Similar model, instead of ligating a coronary vessel, you can treat them with poisons for the heart like isoproteranol. And there too, we see dramatic changes in improvement in survival, gene expression changes, and overall uh, improvement in the heart. So the idea is, and this is something actually that Mark taught me when we were writing a chapter together, is that you really, the primary molecule, it's pretty ridiculous to think you could pull a molecule out of a screen and actually that could become a drug. And even though that's the pathway we were, we were pursuing, it was very naive. And I think the idea is what you need to do is get the original molecule out of a cell-based screen, you have a primary hit, do mechanistic studies, and then find the target. And then once you have the target, first of all, you validate that the target plays a role in the disease you're studying, and then you can use target, the target as a source or as a source for the new screen to find real molecules that could actually become drugs. So that's where we're working now. We did a, we did a screen using this molecule uh, against uh, GPCR. There are many reasons why the molecule looked like it could be a, a, a regulator of GPCR activity. Um, basically, primarily because it works so well in vivo, we did a screen and we were able to identify one particular GPCR, something called GPR, GP, GPR68 or OGR1, a molecule or a, a receptor that had never been studied in the cardiovascular system at all. No one had ever really anticipated that it might play a role, although there's actually a strong rationale because it's actually an acid sensing receptor. It has pro, it, it has histidine residues in its extracellular loops that can be protonated, changing the conformation of the molecule and inducing uh, downstream signaling. So it actually makes sense that in, in ischemic tissues where, where low pH is very prevalent, it should play a role in the heart. We were able to find our molecule actually acts through this receptor. We're not sure yet whether it's a direct ligand for the receptor, probably isn't, but acts through the receptor, induces calcium signaling and alters uh, gene expression. The most exciting thing is when we looked at this receptor again, it was exactly where we would like it to be. It was in the epicardium of the heart where those cells that I described initially, the epicardium derived cells are. We found receptor positive cells. The idea is maybe our molecule is actually targeting these cells. It's in regions of uh, damage, like this is the border zone. This is the blue cells here. All the muscle staining is gone. The actinin, all you see, the, in the border zone of the heart, in normal heart, there's very little expression of this receptor, but the border zone of the heart, you see very dramatic expression. And even in human tissue samples, we can see expression of this receptor. So it's an acid sensing receptor, potentially regulated by our small molecule. That's exactly where we would like it to be in zones of injury in the heart. And that's just sort of a model of, of where we are with that. Again, many sort of tests to do yet we're not it's not it's not conclusive that our molecule is a ligand for this receptor but it seems to to act through this receptor in some manner 
Now, one of the problems is that if you identify with these stem cell modulator small molecules, and for us, for example, we're targeting the heart. We're looking for molecules that can uh, mediate heart repair. But the truth is the body has stem cells everywhere. That's something we call the stem cellome. And you may be designing molecules to target the heart, thinking that, that those molecules will have action in heart repair, but the truth is, they'll go, if you administer them systemically, they can go everywhere. And we had this problem. This, you may remember, this is Jenny Shea. You may not recognize her in her cowboy hats and cowboy boots, but she worked here. She trained in the Gage Lab. We worked together in sort of the neuroscience aspect of this project. And it turned out that when, when we put this molecule that, again, we thought would be a cardiogenic small molecule that would mediate heart repair, on brain slices, this is hippocampal slices in a dish, it lit up the brain slice on, just on fire. And, and we were able to show that it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So Jenny, of course, was very excited about this. This is potentially a new neurogenic small molecule. I was upset because this meant it may kill the prospects of developing a drug for the heart. In fact, it turns out that the molecule is great at inducing adult hippocampal neurogenesis. Um, in, and we've We've confirmed this in, in many, many experiments. Two different labs have confirmed this. So that it is actually neurogenic. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, blood barrier, and it's neurogenic in the brain. For me, that's an off-target side effect, right? But in, in reality, it may turn out that, act, that could be its, its more relevant therapeutic uh, purpose. So one thing to mention again about these stem cell modulator small molecules, they can fool you. And we were talking about this a little bit at dinner last night is that the, although we call this a, a cardiogenic small molecule, if you only look at the trees, you're going to miss the forest. And you really have to look at the global picture of what these molecules do to stem cells in terms of gene expression. If we look at what we call cardiac stem cells, we see dramatic activation of this molecule, ISX, of the cardiac gene program. It clearly turns, pushes these cells towards cardiac differentiation. <laughs> But if you use neural stem cells instead, look at that same molecule, it, it pushes the cells to towards neurogenic differentiation. So it has different effects on different stem cells, and it will do this wherever it finds stem cells in the body. We don't know yet how it affects other stem cell populations, but this is one of the dangers in this whole session is about targeting endogenous stem cells. You have to be wary that these cells are everywhere. And if you make a molecule, even though you think you're targeting the heart, you may be mistaken. And it confuses cells, because if we again take a cell, this is a, this is a different molecule, I'll just call them one and two here, you'll see molecule one turns these cells into muscle cells, molecule two turns these same cells into neural type cells. You put them both together, that's some completely screwed up cell type. So you can confuse these cells, and this is what these molecules will be doing in the body. If they find stem cells in the body, they'll be inducing confusion. And if you look at this cell and say, well, I'm just looking for expression of the red marker because that's a muscle cell, you might call this a muscle cell, depending on your criteria. But it's a fake cell. It's not a real cardiomyocyte. It's some screwed up cell right, that has been that induced into some cell fate through a completely artificial uh, program using the small molecules. So the idea for where we are now, and I'll finish up in just a second, is that we recognize this problem, so we need to have localized, either develop molecules that don't cross the blood-brain barrier, or develop strategies to locally deliver the molecules to the heart. So one, one strategy that we're doing, this is in collaboration with Jay Zhang at uh, University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, is we use um, fi fibrin uh, patches that we put on the surface of the heart. Again, sort of targeting directly those cells that are on the surface of the heart that we believe participate in repair and have the potential for regenerative um, rebuilding of, of heart muscle. And we can show that the, the, when we put our drug in those fibrin patches on the heart, we can have dramatic effects on the biology of the repair process. I don't really have time to show you too much data in regards to that. The, the second thing I just want to mention briefly is um, something that this company in Texas called Lone Star Heart is doing where they inject an alginate material, seaweed derived, I saw a lot of this out in the ocean yesterday, kelp. They basically make a biopolymer from the kelp called alginate and are injecting it into the heart of patients. They've done 30 or so patients now in Europe and, 
and elsewhere in the world, not in the United States, it's not FDA approved yet, but seems to be very, very successful. The original, the initial results will be released at the AHA meeting uh, in November. But we've now taken to starting to use this strategy to actually deliver our molecule into the heart of, of mice. And this is an example of a mouse that has been injected. This is a particular mouse where we activate uh, lax uh, desmef, it's called a desmef mouse, where uh, MEF2 activity is induced by expression of the, uh, 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 by implantation of the alginate uh, B. So these are the new strategies that we're trying to figure out how we can localize delivery, because clearly these molecules are very powerful. They will have systemic effects throughout the body. So this is the lab group responsible for all this work. I just wanted to thank the funding sources, including HA, something in Texas called uh, CPRIT, uh, Cancer Protection and Research Institute, and NIH, NHLBI, we're part of the Progenitor Cell Biology Consortium, the UO1, and then uh, some support from Lone Star Heart. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. One more thing I want to say, we have a rock and roll band in Texas, and if any of you are coming to the AHA meeting in uh, November, you've got to come to our show uh, at the end of the AHA meeting. And I'll stop there and take any questions. You might recognize Deepak Srivastava. He's a... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, yeah, that was great. Okay. Uh, time for a couple of questions. Oh, I'm coming, right here. Did it affect the cell type that you have shown on the heart, uh, small molecule on the brain? Is there any evidence that you actually have a toxic effect, or maybe there are local mechanisms that then would keep them within uh, certain limits? You know, they would not allow them to have some uncontrolled effect locally. So do you, do you see any toxic effect, essentially? Any you, toxic you, effect? No, a, actually, one of the rem remarkable things of this molecule is we can inject, we can basically marinate the mouse in this molecule for months and months, and there's absolutely no toxicity. Yet we know it's having biological activity on gene expression in particular cell types. There's, even in the brain, there are no real behavioral effects. We see no evidence, and we've done some preliminary toxicity type pharmacology studies, we see no evidence of toxicity at all, although it induces gene expression changes probably all over the body. Uh, great, we have another one right here. Maybe, maybe I'll ask a quick one while we're waiting. Uh, a question I have that's sort of relevant to this topic generally is the timing of delivery of an agent you find. So at what point following Infarc would you imagine delivering your drug? And, and how does that relate to the relative importance of fibrosis versus muscle right. regeneration? Well, it has to be very fast because actually that the thickening of the epicardium happens very, very quickly within actually hours and after the infarct. It needs to seal basically the hole, otherwise the heart is in jeopardy of, of blowing out, right, because of the pressure inside. So it needs to act very quickly to prevent the fibrotic scar. One thing that actually discourages the potential for regeneration is that scar. But on the other hand, you can't block scar formation because then the heart will rupture. So there has to be some sort of balance between those two, which is a very tricky issue for the heart. Right. You need some fibrosis, but not, you know, you'd like to encourage the cells to, to be able to regenerate muscle cells. Right. Very good. Yeah. Maybe one more question over here. Yeah, I was curious is if your lead development library gave you some more insight into that, that sort of being able to stimulate both the neural and these, and these cardiac uh, type stem cells, whether that, that was sort of obligatory or whether you had, there was like a little bit of SAR insight. Uh, right, as to well, we're working on, one thing I actually didn't mention too is this molecule actually works on beta cells from the pancreas as well. And actually be, because it stimulates neuro D, neuro D is called beta 1 or beta 2, can stimulate insulin production. So we're trying to figure out, using SAR, trying to find a neural-specific molecule or a cardiac-specific molecule to try to do that. So far, it's been really tricky, and it may be that there's a common pathway, maybe that receptor that sort of activates differentiation in all of these lineages. So that's a very tricky problem, but a very good idea. We're, work we're desperately working yeah, I'm on just that. curious, because the GPCRs these days, it, it looks like they, they turn out to be fairly allosteric in, in being able to to have kind of sculptable uh, outputs. Right. This is probably an allosteric regulator, as far as we know. Mark. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, have you considered using the ISX compounds in any kind of model of traumatic brain injury, perhaps as an immediate application? 
after, say, auto accidents, plane crashes, NFL football hits, things like that? Right. Uh, we've, we've tried that. Again, I'm, since I'm in cardiology, I have a hard time getting my grants accepted by the neuroscience people. But that's why I'm working with Jenny to try to do that. But we think there's great potential. In fact, the true therapeutic potential of this molecule might be in the brain or in the nervous system. So that's something we're really, we're really looking at. Again, our focus is the heart. But I think, and this is sort of shows you how this kind of strategy right, can lead you to the, the wrong fish right, that you may not want to keep. But it's, it's actually, actually shows the value, I think, of the strategy, is you just have to keep an open mind to find things, chase things that you may not have been expecting.